Welcome, everyone, to the 2020 New Hampshire gubernatorial debate. And uh, today we have with us, well, the two people who decided to show up. It's uh, Karen Testerman. Karen, wave. <laughs> and nobody. Uh, nobody, are we going by nobody? We are going by nobody. Nobody. Okay. It's the only name I have. All right. It's the truth. Okay. So... Um, I've got some questions here. We've uh, come up with our, some of our own. We've had uh, candidates uh, submit them. We have had uh, listeners uh, submit them. So let's get right into it. The really obvious question I think that everybody's asking these days is, well, um, starting with you, Karen, how would you have dealt with the... Oh, we, oh we're going to do introductions first. Excuse me. Um, pardon me. Let's go into intros. Uh, Karen, uh, please, you have two minutes to introduce yourself. Oh, well, I'm a mother, wife, uh, daughter of uh, military members. We cover the Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, Coast Guard, and I was even a Marine mom while we were, uh, we were stationed in Australia for the Embassy Guards. So um, quite, a, quite a span of military background. We came to New Hampshire in 1993. Uh, as a choice, uh, once we re re uh, reviewed all of the taxing, et cetera, opportunities, and we decided that New Hampshire was the best place to come to. And uh, since then, I've been involved in um, education, uh, family issues, the uh, electrical issues, voter fraud, uh, constitutional is issues, um, with organizations helping to found them, ha helping to um, promote them and building a uh, cross section with them. And I also host a radio program and a, and a uh, television program. Very good. Uh, nobody, two minutes, introductions. Okay. Uh, well, my name is Nobody and I'm running for governor because nobody uh, knows how to live your life better than you do and nobody deserves that kind of power. And uh, I've been a lot of things uh, in my life. I was a computer programmer. That's what I wanted to be when I was, uh, and uh, what, what I was. Um, I worked for a lot of major clients. I worked for uh, Rider Dedicated Logistics. I worked for GTE Data Systems. I worked for uh, IBM. I worked for Citibank. And um, I, uh, I, I did that for a long time. I also had a wife who I loved very much and who died of cancer, and uh, that changed my life in a lot of ways. I, um, I eventually left my career, went back to school, came to New Hampshire, and one of, the, one of my goals in moving here was to be free. And, uh, and one of the reasons for it was because I believe that the state's interference in my wife's medical care is one of the reasons that she died. And uh, so anyway, I've since then devoted myself full time to fighting for freedom, for freedom for anybody who wants freedom. Um, and I've concentrated partially on the uh, war on drugs because that's been a very important attack on freedom of Americans. Um, both directly and indirectly, um, but I've also uh, worked on gun rights issues. I have also worked on um, trying to build bridges uh, with people of other races and to bring some peace to an America that really needs more peace. Um, and I've been trying also to, I've been uh, operating a church which is uh, of its own theology, but it's basically deist. And uh, it... Uh... All right. Thank you very much. So let's get it right into the questions here. Uh, there will be 90 seconds to answer the question and then 60 seconds for a rebuttal from, obviously, the opposing candidate. And then the opposing candidate will then have the 90 seconds to answer the question and then the first candidate will be able to rebut uh, 60 seconds. So it's uh, 90 seconds for the answer, 60 seconds for the rebuttal. So we will uh, commence here with the 
First question to Karen Testerman. How would you have dealt with COVID twere you governor? Actually, as uh, governor of New Hampshire, I would have uh, trusted the Constitution, which limits the power of the elected officials, and um, trust the people of New Hampshire to make their own decisions. So I would have given them the situation, the um, models that were being promoted, and I would have turned around and said to them, it's up to you. Here's some things that you can do to make sure that you can um, best uh, make sure that you can survive any um, illness that might come forward, that uh, we are going to help you in any way that we can to be informed. But I would have left it up to the people to make their own decision on uh, what was the best thing for them to do. Very good. Nobody? Your 60 seconds. Um. I actually, I, I think our answers are going to be very similar, um, but that's that's a good thing. I, um, I, uh, I too, I would I would trust the people of New Hampshire. I recognize that it does not require a medical degree to become the uh, governor of New Hampshire. It doesn't require any special knowledge. It requires common sense more than anything else. And common sense says that different people evaluate risk differently. And that that's part of how mankind became what it is. Different people make decisions of different qualities. And by doing so, they ensure their own survival or they ensure their own destruction. And that is our right. Because we don't know for sure what's true. We don't know for sure that we're right about... like. I don't criticize people who wear masks, even though that's not my view of the of of what we should be doing, because maybe they're right. Maybe I'm wrong. But what I do do is I let people make their own choices because nobody knows how to do it better than you do. Very good. Uh, Karen, do you have any rebuttal to that? No, I think he answered it quite well. I, uh, you know, we're in violent agreement. The, <laughs> <laughs> we are in agreement because it is up to the individual to make those assessments. They know better what uh, their bodies are uh, going to in, um, react, how their bodies are going to react, and they know whether they've got coexisting morbidities. They know um, various other things that there is not one size fits all. We're all individuals. We were created individually. There's no two people that are exactly the same. So you're going to have different decisions made based on those uh, input. And it can't be from somebody sitting in an office in the in uh Concord that's going to be able to tell you exactly how to live your life. Very good. I think the second question that uh, is probably all on our minds is that the nation, um, around the nation, there are peaceful protests and violent city burning events going on all at the same time. It's difficult for a person to look at a television and to discern exactly what's going on, but it appears as though there are people with legitimate concerns about a, about legitimate situations, and there are people that are under the cover of those concerns going around and setting businesses on fire, private businesses, government buildings, uh, these sorts of things. And I think a lot of Americans are rightly quite concerned as to what's going on with the nation. As the governor, nobody, what would you do about the riots and the protests as they exist currently? Well, first, I would be grateful that I'm in New Hampshire and we haven't any. Um, so that would be, uh, that would be my, my first thing. But that doesn't mean that we haven't had uh, some incidents that are at least quite possibly um, police brutality. Uh, there was a man, and, and quite possibly racist br uh, police brutality, there was a man who was dragged by his dreadlocks from his car uh, on the accusation that his car was stolen, but his car was not stolen. So I want to know how that mistake was made. 
Okay, and I want to know if somebody needs to lose lose their job for that for that mistake. The best way not to have black people uh, riding in the streets because they're being shot down like dogs by the police is for the police to stop shooting black people down like dogs. This this is a no brainer, and uh, at the same time, I'm not going to say that every police killing is wrong. And I'm not going to say that it's limited only to blacks because there was a guy named Duncan Lemp uh, down in Virginia, I believe, or possibly uh, Maryland. Uh, but the police got a uh, got a call um, and it was one of these red flag calls where we don't like his politics or something. So we uh so we want his guns taken away they they came to his house at four o'clock in the morning and they killed him in his sleep um and and this is this is equally unacceptable because although i i will unabashedly say black lives matter and they and they do and it has to be re, and it has to be a reminder i i will also say that all lives do matter and all lives matter equally it's just that we haven't acknowledged black lives the way that we should Karen, 60 seconds. We need to identify people as being totally the victims. We can certainly go through uh, any number of uh, ba ethnic backgrounds and say that they have been attacked at one time or another. There is good and bad in every situation. But I have to say in the state of New Hampshire that I'm very proud of our police our law enforcement because they are some of the best trained in the United States of America. We have... Uh, units in our state who are uh, acknowledged as being the top uh, performers in the state. They constantly are going through their uh, training uh, regiment. They're uh, assessing what they could do better and uh, avoiding any of these um, specific uh, situations. And I do think that part of the problem is the um, the court of public opinion that gets uh, decided. And, you know, our Constitution said that you're innocent until proven guilty. And we take these little snippets of um, video and it goes viral. And in the court of public opinion, you're guilty now. So I think that we have to step back and give uh, the proper uh, judicial uh, oversight on many of these things and allow for the investigations to go forward as they should. Very good. Um, nobody, you have 60 seconds. Okay. Um, I guess the only rebuttal I would give, I think some of the, uh, some of the law enforcement in New Hampshire has been excellent and I've actually gone out and done some studies by getting myself arrested. So I've gotten to find out how different, uh, different police departments, operate and there are some that have been very good there are some that have been awful the bedford police department for example charged me with being a felon in possession of a garden tool which is not a crime under new hampshire law because i had a garden tool a, a machete in my trunk they not only charged me with it they charged me with it twice and they uh, and they did it knowing that i had broken no law that I was innocent by virtue of the act I was accused of wasn't illegal. And, uh, and so that is certainly, it was either corruption or incompetence prolonged on, on both of their parts. And I'm not the, I'm certainly not the only one who suffered this sort of thing. Very good. Next question for nobody. What changes I don't know. I don't think a rebuttal to the rebuttal because Every that is the. Gets, it makes sense. Did get the rebuttal to the first Answer question. The question. Karen, the question. did you have something you'd like to to add to that? I would, because as a governor, uh, it is up to the local police uh, administration to oversee their own people. As the governor, you're uh, primarily. Uh, looking at a larger picture and you're setting the tone and the vision for the law enforcement. And I would be working with our, uh, you know, the only ones that I really would have any oversight with is specifically would be our state police. And so uh, I would be working to set the vision and encouraging uh, our law enforcement at the local levels to be more 
observant and uh, ab address their own problems. But, uh, you know, it is a, this is a state where we do rely upon our local communities to make their own decisions. Very good. Nobody, um, since we're talking about the, the police here, what changes would you recommend to police departments in New Hampshire? Um, the Well, the biggest change that, that I would recommend is one that's already hopefully in the works, which is the release of the Lori list, um, which is a list of cops who have had uh, – they're they're basically considered too untrustworthy to testify. testify. But yet we're, we don't know this this um, what's on this who's on this list. We don't know why they're on the list. We don't know why they're still on the payroll if they're too untrustworthy to, to testify in court. Um, and we do know that there have been people framed in New Hampshire. Uh, that was as a result of a Massachusetts drug. Uh, drug lab, which was deliberately for defrauding the state of New Hampshire out of money, but more importantly, de de uh, defrauding people out of their lives by falsifying test results. So it's a uh, it's it's a very it's a very important issue. Prison is is a bad place, and it should be a bad place. But people should only done go there for harming others not for making foolish decisions in their own lives. That is within, that's between a man and his creator, the, fool, the foolish decisions he makes. Karen, 60 seconds to rebut. Well, I, I'm sorry, what was the question originally? Yeah, very good, fine. Uh, the, question, the question is, what changes would you recommend regarding the police? And you have 90 seconds. Okay, sorry, that's all right. Uh, actually, it, it is up to the pl individual police departments to uh, address their own problems. I think that in the state of New Hampshire, like I said, they are some of the best trained. There are those who do make mistakes, and it is up to the individual uh, locales to address that situation. However, uh, I'm not so sure that the Lori's List should be even in existence because, as um, nobody said, there is a uh, if they are untrustworthy to be able to testify, then they should probably not be on the payroll in the first place. They should have been released and uh, um, allowed to uh, pursue other areas in the way of a vocation. But I, um, as far as our police departments go, I'm I'm very very. I am a city councilor in Franklin, and I have to say that my police department is one of the best in the state, and I don't see a whole lot of uh, changes that I would make. Our, our biggest problem is finding good applicants, and uh, because of the media and the uh, dissing of our police and the constant pointing out how terrible they all are, is uh, it has put us in a situation where our police are now the victims and, and they're not allowed to come and assist us in the way that they have been traditionally. So I think there is some, there definitely is some public relations that need to be done on both sides to make a difference in the future. Nobody, 60 seconds for rebuttal. Um, let's see, I would, I would say, that there there is room to go too far there there is room to over criticize police because whenever you start um judging someone in your uh uh whenever whenever you start judging someone without knowing all the facts then you're definitely doing it wrong um i th i think that the uh she's right that uh it is not part of my job description to manage police departments as governor but I do believe that I would have a moral duty not only to set a tone, but to find out uh, when, when these accusations are made and when it's an important uh, accusation against a, uh, against a cop or a, or a politician, I think the governor should take an interest in finding out what really happened and in making sure that it's not a case where the police investigate themselves and decide that the police did nothing wrong. That 
That is d- that that is what causes cities to burn. It's not the killings. It's the uh, image of non-investigation. Karen, sixty seconds. Well, I think uh, you have a point uh, that there is uh, a situation where uh, we do need to ob- uh, observe. But again, it, you're innocent until proven guilty. And I do think that there is a process and that we need to uh, address that process. And certainly there is a swamp in the state of New Hampshire and it does need to be cleaned and it does need to be drained just like it is at the national level. So there is uh, a great amount of assessment that does need to be made across the board and that's something that you probably won't know about we can speculate and uh quarterback you know monday afternoon or evening quarterback anything but the the reality is until you actually get into the position and you're uh, afforded the information uh across the board about what you are uh, what is actually happening there uh you can't really make that type of decision today very good. So uh, uh, there's an obvious uh, person missing from the Republican gubernatorial debate, the governor of the great state of New Hampshire. His Excellency. His Excellency. Yes, indeed. <laughs> there he is. His Excellency is up on the screen with his uh, face mask on. Uh, yeah. So, Karen, why did you decide to run against a sitting governor who, by many accounts, is very popular? Well, popularity isn't everything. And when you see and listen to the stories that are going across this state uh, because of the extended uh, stay at home emergency orders, emergency uh, or executive orders that he has been issuing, uh, I I just couldn't sit back any longer. I also have a microbiology degree and I was looking at the um, scenario that was being presented to us. I thought that it did not make a lot of sense that there needed, we do have a constitution for a reason and that it was not being followed. It was not being uh, implemented in the way that it should be. And so um, listening to many of the stories, for example, we had businesses that are no longer going to be opening and we had a good economy. Our uh, unemployment rate went from 2.6 up to 14 point something. And then uh, it's been dropping true as more and more of our businesses are allowed to open, but open with edicts. And uh, that is more tyrannical than it is uh, the republic that we are supposed to be operating in. So I got in because I had to uh, offer the people another uh, alternative and uh, one that would be more constitutional and uh, allowing people to the, be free as we are supposed to be in the state of New Hampshire. Our, uh, con- our motto from John Stark is live free or die for there are worse things than dying. And, um, and so we were not supposed to be here to live and comply. And so I got in primarily for that reason But uh, there are other things that need to be done in the state of New Hampshire, and I'm looking at those as well. Very good. Nobody? Um, Well, I'm going to start. I noticed that both of us have been running over time, and and there's been an issue at at communicating that to us. There's there's not a means for it. So I'm going to suggest that we just let the thing go as long as it needs to. And we've got to get all the Okay. I'll, I'll communicate it. Okay. Fair enough. Could I have the question? Yes, please. Uh, why did you decide to run against a sitting governor who by all accounts is very popular? Oh, I decided to run against Mr. Sununu, who I agree with on some things. And I'll, and I'll first tell you what's good about Mr. Sununu. Uh, Mr. Sununu vetoed some very bad gun laws, some gun laws that were horrifically bad. Um, and that could have gotten somebody killed the way Dem- Duncan Lemp was killed. Um, but I'm running against him because I don't... Um, I started running before the the COVID thing um, because he refused to sign uh, legalization of marijuana, which is really the same issue as COVID. It's a question of 
Who makes your medical decisions for you? Or do you make your own? And that, to me, is a vital issue. And and it's the big place where, where Mr. Sununu has fallen down on, on the job. Um, and so I would... Uh, that's the biggest thing. Very good. Karen, you have 60 seconds if you'd like to uh, address that, or we can go on to the next question. It's up to you. Actually, I will address that in the fact that my goal, goal in being the governor Well, very good. I will. Uh, whoop, did Karen's face move? Okay. Uh, Karen is, uh, we're having some technical difficulties. Please stand by. Technicalties. Yep. And technicalties. Indeed. The question is, uh, why did you decide to run against the sitting governor who by many accounts is very popular? And I will, we're trying to reconnect now. I I'm not going to move on to questions. I want uh, Karen to have the yeah, opportunity to to uh, to uh, go in here, but I will just. No, nope, we're um, reconnecting. I don't think we have much. Uh, there's yeah, there's not much we can do on this because I I don't want to uh, put Karen in a situation where she is unable to respond on anything, yeah. and I don't want to move forward with her. Okay. Oh, and she's back. I'm back. Oh. Okay. Oh, and thank God. you're addressing... Uh, I was uh, addressing the the, uh, uh, the uh, marijuana situation, and the what I was saying was that uh, I'm looking at how it impacts our young people and the developing mind, and I'm con that is my major concern. And I have not seen anything that has been presented to me that makes sure that the developing mind of our young people under the age of 18 uh, will not have access either through edibles or accidental uh, um, a secondhand smoke, all kinds of uh, situations like that. And all you have to do is look into Colorado and see what, what they have been experiencing. And it is uh, not something that I think that we should be doing here besides the fact that if you even if you get medical marijuana you can no longer purchase a firearm and uh, that is just a, a major factor and i don't think a lot of people do think consider that very good nobody um well i i, I first I'll, I'll address the firearm issue which is every single gun law on the books is unconstitutional and is a violation of both state and federal constitution and anyone who enforces them is breaking the law not enforcing the law but um on on back on the issue of marijuana i certainly cannot guarantee that uh kids won't be able to get uh marijuana when it's legal because it's illegal and they can get it now so the question is, since they can get it now and they'll be, at it, be able to get it then, what are we paying billions of dollars for? We can't keep it away from them. We can't keep it out of the prisons. We could lock New Hampshire down as tight as Concord State Prison, and it would not keep the drugs out because there are drugs in Concord State Prison. So sent, we sh what we should do is what they did at the end of, of Prohibition. We should bow to reality. We should recognize that our people will make their own choices. Very good. Um, what would you do, uh, nobody, if elected to help businesses and our economy recover? There's no, there's no denial that, in fact, uh, you know, actions have been taken today, and you can't go back in time and make them unhappen. So, what would you do now to uh, help our the businesses and our economy to recover? I would get out of their way. I would stop interfering with them, and more importantly. I would, I would allow the creation of more businesses in our state by fighting regulation in, when, in any way that I could, both to avoid the enforcement of existing law, to avoid the implementation of new law, because every law that's on the books makes it harder to do business. And every law that makes it harder to do business makes unemployment higher. And every law that makes unemployment higher makes wages lower. And so 
that is not good for our state. It's not good for our people. And we have a right to buy things, even if the state has not blessed the things that we buy, because the state is not our God. Karen, 90 seconds. I would be be reducing regulations and reducing uh, the uh, overall taxes, but I also would be addressing the fact that we have a spending problem in this uh, state and we need to balance our budget uh, through uh, reducing spending. And uh, part of that uh, also would be helpful to our um, our our small businesses in getting out of their way. One of the other things that I think that we knew also need to do is we need to promote New Hampshire businesses rather than uh, issuing contracts, et cetera, to out of state businesses uh, and through sole sources and so, uh, such that we need to actually uh, be working with the people in New Hampshire so that they are growing and exporting rather than uh, bringing other businesses in. Another area where I think that we need to address is that uh, when we do have contracts that our, uh, our qualified New Hampshire residents would be given first priority. Very good. Um, if you would, nobody. Um, I would. I would have one concern with that, and I and I don't know. Um, there, there's definitely some wisdom into buying locally, but there's also a problem that that uh, that means that you're picking your suppliers as a way of picking the losers, the winners and losers in the market, um, and it's a form of nepotism. And the problem with with nepotism is if you limit the number of people you can hire down to down to a very small number, then that means you're going to have to pay a higher price on average. And so the taxpayer will suffer to some extent um, for that. But but also, I don't I think the state government needs to be buying a lot fewer things. And uh, and that that to me is is more vital than sourcing it locally, although there is some benefit to lo- local sourcing. Tax cuts are also essential. Uh, the Tao Te Ching says that the people are hungry. If the people are hungry, it's because the taxes are too high. And I agree. As a Taoist, I I go with that that theory. I'm mighty hungry when it comes to taxes. Karen, what uh, uh, you got? Sixty seconds. Okay, um, I wasn't saying that we would just uh, sole source out of New Hampshire. What I was saying that we would. Um, uh, we should be encouraging our businesses from New Hampshire to grow. Uh, when you're talking about contracts, those should be out on a competitive bid. There shouldn't be no sole sourcing. And again, I'm not saying that you just only hire New Hampshire uh, residents. I'm saying that we give them priority if they are qualified. They have to be qualified first. And then you give them priority before you start going outside of the state to find other workers to come in and uh, take those jobs. Very good. Um, Another one of the elephants in the room here at the Republican gubernatorial debate is in New Hampshire, we have very high property taxes. At least um, we spend a great deal on um, local schools. Now, you can move from states like New Jersey and New York and you're getting a tax cut, but there are states you could move from and the taxes would seem ridiculously high. I think one of the reasons for that would be government schools, and there's some real issues surrounding government schools, and the legislature really hasn't dealt with them here in New Hampshire. What would your position be on government schools, uh, Karen Testman? Well, I really believe in uh, in school choice. I would like to see the funding actually go with the child. But I want to step back to what you were saying about how high our property taxes are. When my husband and I decided to come to New Hampshire, we did an assessment of the places in the United States, although we were uh, probably partial to New England. Uh, We did an assessment of property taxes, uh, sales taxes, um, income taxes, et cetera. And New Hampshire actually came out very, very high in the fact that they were the least um, burdensome to our income. So, uh, 
this is uh, a misnomer, I think, that while we do have high property taxes, we do not have a sales tax, we do not have an income tax, although I will say that we do have an interest and dividends tax, which can be translated into an income tax, especially for those who have uh, been forward thinking and uh, put savings as aside so that they could uh, provide for themselves later on in their life. As far as the schools go, I do think that we have to get back to more local control of our schools, local spending. I, and there is nothing in the Constitution that says that the state is responsible for funding of our schools. Uh, even though the Claremont decision came down, it is a court decision. It is not law. And unfortunately, many times when the courts make a decision, we say, oh, that's got to be the law. 90 and it seconds. Is Thank you. Uh, nobody. Uh, what, um, what's your position on schools, government schools? Well, I, I personally, I do not believe that the government should be in the business of education for the same reason that I do not believe that the government should be in the business of running churches. Because in both cases, uh, they're telling the citizens what they should believe. And when the government tells the citizens what to believe, then it doesn't it isn't really meaningful for the citizens to tell the government what to do. Um, and so I think it's, I would like to see that uh, removed entirely from the, uh, from the government's purview, but I'm mostly concerned about the management of schools. If there was a voucher program to help people, uh, you know, get by as they're learning to, to, to educate their, their own families, then I would want to see a voucher program where they could take that to any school of their of their choice, um, and without state standards, because again, state standards is forcing the the state to become the arbiter of what is true. And anybody who observes our politicians knows that they are not the people who should be deciding what's true for us, because they have a very difficult time in identifying the truth. Nobody tells the truth. <laughs> Karen, you have 60 seconds to respond. Certainly. And parents should be the ones who are in control of their children's education. And, and that's why I believe in school choice. And I do believe that if uh, it is to the benefit of the community that we have children who are educated, who can go forward. But uh, there again, it is uh, something that if the funding followed the child, then, uh, then we would have more control by the parents. And in fact, at one time, it was five or six families that would get together and decide who the teachers would be, and they did the hiring and firing of the teachers, and therefore the education was um, up to the parents' standard and, and their own decisions. And I do think that that's the best place for it to be. Nobody, you have 60 seconds to respond. Um, well, I, th I think we're kind of in violent, violent agreement almost. Um, the, uh, I guess the only, the only disagreement that we've got is, uh, is state management of, uh, of schools. So I guess I'd, uh, go back to that. Um, and the one, some of the things that, that I'm hearing from, from parents and from concerned people that, uh, that make them very worried about uh, the schools is uh, they're they're worried about their children being indoctrinated on the subjects of guns, on on sexual uh, beliefs, one way or the other. Some people believe that the sexual uh, that sex education in schools will be too much, and some people will be believe, are afraid it will be too little. I say that each group has a right to find for their children the sex education that they prefer and that that's uh, and so i do i i agree as as well thank you next question um nobody what would you do as the uh, governor of the state of new hampshire about the drug war uh well my first act as governor would be to pardon every victimless crime in in new hampshire history and what that means is the the first things that i would pardon would be the gun crimes 
uh, because those are not only those those laws aren't just wrong; they're unconstitutional and they violate an enumerated constitutional right. Uh, the right of the people shall, to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And then I would move on to uh, drugs, prostitution. Basically, you should not be harmed by the state if you have not harmed another person. And that's represented in the Declaration of, of Independence, uh, where it says that uh, it is merely to preserve our liberty that governments are instituted amongst men. And so uh, that, to me, is, is a vital issue. Karen, you have 90 seconds. What would you do uh, regarding the drug war in New Hampshire? Well, fundamentally, I think the drug war is a, um, a problem that we have with our families. In fact, we need strong families in order to uh, move forward. So uh, I would, and the governor really has the ability to use the bully pulpit to reinforce the value of family uh, keeping families together, making sure that the biological mother and father are raising the children. That we know that that is the gold standard, uh, so to speak, and that's what we should be holding up and encouraging people to do. We know that there are also people who make bad choices, who, who uh, for one reason or another, there is a breakdown in that. But that doesn't mean that we aren't working towards trying to have more people in that stable mother and father fam, uh, family. And the, th the reality is, is that 75% uh, of your prison population and those people who are having encounters with law enforcement are those who do not have a father in the home. And so we need to really reestablish the value of fatherhood and, uh, and the, the value of both parents that they have on their children because then when children are raised in a family where mother and father, the biological mother and father are both present, uh, they do better academically, mentally, psychologically, they do better uh, and they're less likely to have encounters with law enforcement. Nobody? In general, I mean, I definitely like the idea of having the, uh, having the family take uh, take more responsibility, and for churches, um, I I work with um, with people who are addicted, um, and I think that's a very important part of what I do. And partially, that's because I see it as as a spiritual ailment more than it's a medical ailment. It is, um, it's it's something going on in your soul that you can't cope with dealing with and so what it needs to be it needs to be resolved but almost never is force the right answer as a matter of fact when uh the what the a alcoholics anonymous big book says about how to deal with uh addicts is to leave them alone until they want to change their life so long as they're not hurting themselves or others, and when they're ready to help them. But a lot of times, when people are ready under this system, they're in prison. Karen, 60 seconds. Absolutely right. You have to have the, the attitude that you want to uh, get help in order to, get, uh, to receive help. But uh, at the same time, the other side of it is that we have to rebuild the family. We have to restructure the family. When we had less of a problem with opioids and alcoholism, it was back when the families were stronger uh, and you had 70%, uh, 80%, 90% of the families where them, both mother and father were raising their children. Very good. So, uh, Karen Testerman, this question to you. There, we have seen in the very recent days, we have seen federal agents coming into states, um, in some cases with their permission, in some cases without, and they have been, um, let's call it dubiously uniformed, and perhaps and snatching people up off the streets, and they're not making arrests in the way that we're used to. They appear to be going outside of their jurisdiction. Uh, there's some confusing things going on. 
as the uh, governor of the state, the organization that would claim a monopoly privilege in the area of controlling violence in a uh, given area, you would be the chief executive. How would you respond to the governor, govern, uh, the, the United States government, the federal government, coming in with troops and snatching people off the streets? Well, uh, that's something I, I, I am aware of. Uh, I, in fact, I have a very, very good friend, I'm sorry, that um, uh, is in prison right now because he went out to the Bundy Ranch and helped uh, in the um, standing for the freedom of the ben Bundy family. So uh, Jerry DeLamus is now sitting in prison in uh, Fort Devens. And uh, I think that this is something where uh, I would be working with the Fed, um, the government in some way to be able to exonerate him. However, uh, when, as governor, you do have the responsibility to, to, to protect your people, uh, your boundaries within your state, because we are supposed to be a sovereign state. And so I would be um, exercising my right to have my militia uh, counter those people and uh, stop them from uh, violating our laws and making sure that they're not taking away from the privileges of our people. Nobody? Um, yeah, I would definitely want to see that the, uh, that, uh, and, and ensure that the rights of the people were not infringed by the, by the federal government. I think it is, I think it is appropriate as long as there is a federal and a state government, for the federal go for the state government to protect you from the federal government, and for the federal government to protect you from the state government to some extent, uh, when it when it's wrong, um, on on the issue of of immigration in in general, because that um, that's that's who is, is snatching people up. If you don't know, it's ICE. Is they've they've admitted that, and um. Immigration is an issue where I really don't think that people should be criminalized just for crossing a line and trying to find a better life. Um, I think if people want to come and work, I think that's wonderful. If, if they want to come and, and live off welfare, that's, that's not wonderful. But if they want to come and work, I welcome them. Karen, you have 60 seconds to respond. So I, we have laws on immigration. I think we ought to go back to what it was when um, the, we were uh, inviting people into the United States in the first place when we had Ellis Island. You had to have a job. You had to have somebody that was going to sponsor you and you had to be disease free. And I think that uh, walking through the front door is the proper way to do so. I don't agree that you should just be able to say, I want a better life and so I'm gonna co come across the border and I don't have to follow your rules. We have rules for a reason and uh, we need to enforce those rules in order to, uh, because it's not fair to those people who have walked through the front door, done it properly uh, and, and gone through the process to become a citizen, et cetera. Uh, it's not fair to them for someone to just cross the border and say, I'm now here and I deserve to have all of the rights of being an American. You have to actually assimilate. Nobody? 60 seconds. Um, I, I don't have a real concern about about cultural assimilation because I think the culture of the people will take take care of itself and it will, uh, you know, that's that's what they that's what they do. It's not what uh what what the government does um and i think it's important to have uh people coming uh or people at least able to come when i watched the protesters in hong kong and i knew that the result of their protest was not going to be a year and a half in prison like it was for me it was going to be having their their organs harvested by the Chinese government, I, I hated to see that. And I want to see people, people who love freedom, I want to see coming here uh, and, and people who are willing to work for it. Um, and I, th I think that's a very important issue. Uh, I would like to see the system be what it was when my grandparents came from Armenia 
as refugees from the Armenian Holocaust, and they just went through Ellis Island. It was it was a simple, relatively simple process. Very good. We have a uh, viewer question here. This one going to, it would appear, nobody. What does it mean to be bound by oath or affirmation to support the Constitution? You have 90 seconds. Well, it means to me that you have to, most importantly, uh, support the aims of the Constitution, that, that, uh, that you should know what the Constitution says and what it meant in context. You should know things like the Ninth Amendment says that the enumeration in this uh, Constitution of certain rights shall not be held to deny or disparage others uh, retained by the people, and that that factors the very broad life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness from the dec Declaration of Independence in. So... So you, you should know what those things mean, and you should always err on the side of remembering that the government was not, that the Constitution, excuse me, was not written to empower government. It was written to chain government down from mischief, in the words of uh, Thomas Jefferson, and that is its most important function. Karen Testament. What does it mean to be bound by oath or affirmation to support the Constitution? So you have to understand what the Constitution means. You have to have read it to study it. Uh, and uh, I agree that the original intent is something that's very, very important. And so when you take an oath, that means that you are going to operate under the Constitution and the Bill of Rights that it uh, is um, upholding. And so um, very much so, your word is your bond. And um, it unfortunately, that is something where our integrity has um, taken a back seat. It used to be that you could do a handshake and, and uh, get a contract uh, ratified and taken care of simply on a, on a handshake. Unfortunately, today, we don't have that same trust in one another. So, um, but Upholding the Constitution means looking at the original intent and trying everything you can to keep it to that original intent. Nobody, do you have a response to that? Um, let's see. No, I, I think that's uh, I think that is pretty well covered. Well, let's go on to the next question then, since we are responseless at this point. <laughs> Can't respond to a lack of a response, can you, Karen? <laughs> <laughs> um, the... What would you, uh, if the people demanded that New Hampshire declare independence from the United States, what would you be your position as governor? Um, that would go to Karen. Well, certainly as the, it, it is up to the people to make that demand and they would be doing it, I would assume, through the legislature. And that would be something that uh, if it got to my desk. I would have to assess it very carefully and make a decision at the time. I don't know what the circumstances would be, and I can't uh, project at this point what I would actually do in those circumstances. Um, nobody. What would you do if the people of New Hampshire declared independence from the United States? And what would be your position as governor? Well, my personal prejudice would be to support it. And the reason is because uh, the United the United States is, uh, has abandoned federalism. It's dis it has become a place where the federal government is going to make more and more decisions for each of the several states, and the states are to have no say in it. And I think that's one of the reasons that we're becoming more and more divided as a country, is they're trying to make people be the same when they're not the same. And so I, I, would, I would very much uh, support it, of course. What I would try to do would be to uh, obtain uh, safe passage from the other states first. I would approach the other governors, and I would try to get agreements from them that they would not condone uh, New Hampshire citizens being killed 
because they did not want to be part of this government anymore. But we should be able to do it in the same way that uh, Britain left the European Union, uh, if we if we so choose. Karen, do you have a response? I do, and I want to go back to that because, in reality, are you asking if the uh, state of New Hampshire, the people of the state of New Hampshire, wanted to uh, act, act actually go beyond being a sovereign state? I think we have to reestablish our sovereignty to start off with, but we are individual states uh, already, or we should be, and uh, it. As individual states, we make up the country. And are you saying that we want to be a separate country? It would appear as though this question is aimed at the notion that, uh, uh, you know, that, that pe people have gone from zero to 60 uh, rather quickly <laughs> and uh, wish to just go ahead and declare independence uh, from the United States. So well, te technically, we are not supposed to be independent states. And because we are not the United States of America, we are the United States. Uh, it, it, it is a plural, plurality. And so I think that um, I think a little bit more information before I could really make a final decision on any of that. Very good. Um, any thoughts on that, nobody? Um, I, th I think ye certainly there would have to be a lot of things uh, examined about what was going on in terms of uh, of how to do it. And certainly it's highly unlikely that the, that the people are going to make this leap actually during the, what, two years that I might be in office. So, uh, so this is not something that I'm, that I'm planning for, but it's something that um, it may have to happen. It may well be that, that the federal government becomes so overbearing or it becomes uh it repeals the Second Amendment, or it does something that that absolutely cannot be tolerated. And and if the people want to go, I'll go whatever I'll do whatever I can to help them do that. Um, and if other states wanted to secede, I would encourage the federal government not to kill them. Very good. That concludes the questions that we have for the candidates. Um, I'm going to give two minutes to each candidate to uh, give their closing statements. You can uh, say what you wish, dance the boogaloo. I don't care. Uh, Karen, 120 seconds. Go. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for hosting this. This has been a, an interesting uh, exchange of ideas, and I really appreciate it. I hope that the people will consider me as being your next uh, governor of the state of New Hampshire. You can go to KarenTesterman.com where you can become involved in this war. Right now, I do believe that we are fighting tyranny, and our tenth of, uh, Article 10 of the New Hampshire Constitution does give us the right to raise up and replace our government when it becomes tyrannical. And uh, currently, I think our current governor is um, using the uh, edict and his uh, excellency as a power that uh, is something that is totally against the original intent of the New Hampshire Constitution. So uh, with that, uh, I think our uh, easier pathway is simply to uh, unseat him in the primary and to make me your nominee as uh, governor of this, uh, to compete with the Democrat uh, candidate for governor of the state of New Hampshire. And thank you very much again. It's KarenTesterman.com. Very good. KarenTesterman.com. Nobody, you have two minutes. Well... First, uh, Karen, I would like to thank you for your civility. Um, political debate can be a nasty business, and this did not feel like a nasty <laughs> business, and that's how it should be. Um, let's see. I, and I think that uh, I think that I I just that I bring in some ways um, a maybe a higher level of, of liberty in, in my promises, but at the same time, I think I am less likely to be, to be elected just based on the numbers that I, that I have now. But I, I would encourage, uh, 
the that the voters to look into our records, find out about us. I have a criminal record. If you want to call me I'll, and ask me about it and you're a voter, I will tell you about it and I will tell you why it's there. And uh, and I would suggest that you look in that you look into both of us, that you find out um, which one. Uh, which ones you you find acceptable, and that you choose the best alternative that you can to Chris Sununu, who's outlived his usefulness. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in to the New Hampshire gubernatorial debate here in 2020. Uh, our two candidates that uh, deigned to show up were Nobody and Karen Testerman. Nobody, uh, website, please. I'm at electnobody.com, and... Uh, my slogan again is nobody knows how to live your life better than you do, and nobody deserves that kind of power. Karen Testerman. Thank you. That's KarenTesterman.com, uh, and I am pro-freedom, pro-constitution, and pro-Trump. We'd like to invite you to visit Freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.